What do you think of when you hear the word monster? For many people, it's common to automatically think of the vicious beasts recorded in tales and legends for the better part of history. Beasts such as vampires or werewolves, perhaps goblins and ghouls, have been key hellraisers in many stories for centuries now. It's only when you take a moment to specify the humanity of the monster, the mind conjures up faces notoriously linked with true crime. Names such as Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, and Jeffrey Dahmer could be amongst the first human fiends to crop up in one's mind. Crimes are committed daily, with some actions causing trauma beyond any materialistic theft. Some crimes break the heinous threshold with no hesitation, ending in a gruesome murder. Adult men most often perpetrate these cases, but the party responsible for these appalling crimes will shock the world now and again. The crimes committed against Colleen Ritzer were not the result of a delusional ex-lover or longtime stalker. The brutal and tragic end of Colleen Ritzer came instead at the hands of a 14-year-old student named Philip Chisholm. Colleen Ritzer was a Massachusetts native born on May 13, 1989, and raised as the oldest of three children. Described from a young age as someone who was kind and passionate, the world was set well for this vibrant young woman. For as long as family and friends could remember, Ritzer had a dream of helping other people in the form of being a high school math teacher. The dream would become a reality after Ritzer graduated high school, attending a local college to earn the appropriate degrees and documentation to become a teacher. She'd only been graduated from college for a few years when she crossed paths with Philip Chisholm, but she had already made a significant impact on the lives of her students. Ritzer was dedicated to her trade, staying after school on numerous occasions to offer help and tutoring to the students who had trouble grasping the content of her classes. With younger siblings of her own, who were about the age of her students, and only being a few years removed from her secondary education, the lack of generational gap helped many of the students connect. This was documented too, with the Twitter account she possessed. On this account, she stayed in contact with students and assigned different work based on the groups. Born January 22, 1999, Philip Chisholm had only recently moved to the Massachusetts area when the atrocity occurred. The relocation happened around the same time as his parents' divorce, which is believed to have ultimately led to the teen's life being moved. Before locating to the Danvers area, Chisholm and his family lived in Tennessee. It is believed he moved to Massachusetts with his mother, who was mentioned many times in the reports following the incident. Regarded as a soft-spoken and pleasant teen, classmates and teammates of Chisholm all had the same kind of words to attribute to the male. A top scorer on the soccer team, there wasn't much negative to be said from the perspective of his peers. On Tuesday, October 22, 2013, Ritzer asked Chisholm to stay after class to talk with her. At the time, another student was also staying after to ask for help from the math teacher. This second student recalls Ritzer talking to Chisholm about an upcoming math test, wanting to be sure he was comfortable and confident in his abilities. The topic of Tennessee came up. The teacher breaching the subject and Chisholm seemed to get agitated at the mention of his former home state. The conversation hadn't gone on long, according to the witness, when Chisholm became increasingly agitated. Ritzer elected to change the topic. Whether or not the attack was premeditated is unclear, based on the reports given. While some reports say the attack was not premeditated, every statement speaks of the equipment used in the crime being in the attacker's possession. Chisholm had allegedly packed gloves, clothes to change into, a ski mask, and a box cutter with his school things. This displays intent to commit a crime of some kind, though it is unclear if Ritzer had always been the intended target. It was around 3 p.m. that Tuesday afternoon when security cameras in the school's hallway capture Ritzer walking towards the bathroom on the second floor. It is only moments later when the same security camera captures a second person. At first, it is only the second person's head before they duck into the doorway again. The next time we see the figure, a hood is drawn up over their head in an attempt to obscure their face. It is still apparent the second figure was Philip Chisholm. Chisholm would follow Ritzer at a delayed pace. It is theorized he shortened his steps to ensure that he wouldn't catch up with the teacher until she had entered the bathroom. With the hood still over his head, Chisholm would enter the bathroom shortly after Ritzer herself had gone in, but only after pulling on a pair of gloves. Those who evaluated the scene believe Chisholm snuck up behind the 24-year-old woman and pulled the box cutter he had packed from his pocket. Chisholm would then slash the throat of his freshman math teacher 16 times with the weapon, incapacitating the woman brutally. The attack, though, wasn't enough to sate the horrifying urge of the teen, who would follow his brutality by sexually assaulting the woman. After the brutal attack and before Chisholm had left the bathroom, another student entered the facility briefly. They would leave quickly upon entering and believing they walked in on someone changing, having seen a pile of clothes on the floor, along with someone pulling on a pair of pants. It wasn't long after the student's entry and exit when the security footage caught Chisholm leaving the bathroom. Chisholm would return to the bathroom soon after, tugging on a bin behind him while wearing a new jacket. His hood was down this time and he disappeared into the bathroom once more, the bin in tow behind him. 
A short time would pass before he emerged again, still tugging the bin with him before exiting the school and heading towards the nearby woods. It is believed that Ritzer was still alive at this time, barely hanging on after the horrible acts that she had been a victim of. Ritzer would be dumped in the woods near the school and posed obscenely by Chisholm. The teen disrespected the woman further by pulling her skirt up and sexually violating her further with a branch. Before leaving Ritzer to die in the woods, Chisholm took the teacher's underwear and bank card. He would take these items with him, proving his lack of conscience by grabbing food with the teacher's card before going to a local theater to see a movie. Alarm bells began to go off for the family as it grew later into the evening. Chisholm's mother would report him missing when he didn't return home from school, noting the relocation the teen had gone through recently to the police. Richard's parents and siblings would also report their missing family member to the police, searching for the beloved teacher beginning in the evening. During the period of searching for the two individuals, there was no indication police were aware of the connection between the two. Later that evening, going into the early hours of October 23, 2013, Chisholm would be found walking along the side of the highway in the next town over from Danvers. When spotted by police, they turned on their lights to stop and talk with the team. At some point in the exchange, police searched the belongings of Chisholm and found the box cutter, which was still tainted with blood. When questioned about the state of the box cover, Chisholm responded to the officers and reportedly told them the blood was from the girl. Transferred to Danvers police at some point, a more thorough investigation would go underway. Chisholm would provide some context to the scenario to the officers of both forces, but never enough to give away the true brutality of the crime. It is said by many officers the teen actively tried to downplay his actions, portraying his crime as something much less severe than reality. The school security camera footage was reviewed, finding the damning evidence of Chisholm disappearing into the bathroom after Ritzer. When Ritzer's body was found in the wooded areas near the school, along with the bloody articles of clothing, though she was never seen exiting the bathroom again, the case seemed pretty open and shut, even if the explanation for why may have been foggy. They had the evidence they needed to keep the teen detained. As the legal proceedings began to take place, months passing at the time between hearings, Chisholm was kept in custody. He would be held at one point in a youth facility. During his stay here, sometime in the year after the heinous acts he committed against Ritzer, he would carry out a similar attack on a female worker of the facility. Chisholm reportedly watched the workers around him to confirm no one was watching before he chose to follow the worker into a more secluded area. Before entering an area where the worker would be alerted by the sound of his shoed foot, he elected to remove the footwear. Moving into the room quietly, Chisholm would pounce. The woman was attacked sometime before the summer of 2014, being choked and stabbed with a pencil. She came away with only wounds, being saved by other facility workers when they heard the commotion. Chisholm premeditated this attack on the worker and further action was taken to ensure he was not left alone with any females. Chisholm would be put through trial for his heinous acts against Ritzer as an adult, despite being 14 at the time of the crime. The court system proved to go through many hoops, both prosecutors and Chisholm's defense team working tirelessly to ensure the verdict they desired. Chisholm's defense team would pull out many stops along the way, doing everything in their power to have evidential pieces and confessions tossed. Their reasoning for dismissing these pieces of evidence included police delay. The defense cites the police did not immediately read the teenager his Miranda rights when he was detained. The delay, the defense argued, should cause critical pieces of evidence to be inadmissible in court. However, the work the defense tried to do proved futile, as Chisholm would be found guilty over two years after his crime. In 2016, Chisholm was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the robbery, rape, and murder of 24-year-old Colleen Ritzer. At the time of this video, Chisholm serves out his sentence for his heinous deeds against Ritzer. Still, no information is available regarding any charges against the teen for his 2014 attack. The memory of Colleen Ritzer lives on through her family, who encourages the world to be as kind as the young woman was. The school Ritzer worked for also does what they can do to keep her memory alive, past students of the teacher having no hesitation in speaking about her in the highest regard. Though her own life was cut short, Ritzer continues to live on in the hearts of those who had the privilege of knowing her. What did you think about this case? Do you think there's anything that should have been done differently? Do you think teenagers should be tried as adults? Whatever thoughts and comments you may have, be sure to leave them down below. Also, be sure to let us know any cases you'd love to hear a write-up on. Until then, remember to subscribe for more true crime content.